or hopefully I'm doing enough to get to heaven, but I still get to live for my way and live my life. I think that's what he's talking about. And in those cases, what God says is it would actually be better for you just to reject me completely than to do this half-hearted thing trying to follow me. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1, we get an example of this from uh, King Saul. Now, I know y'all are quiet this morning. I mean, I don't, always, I don't always bring this kind of word where we're just hitting each other right between the eyes, but that's the kind of word it is this morning, all right? So you just got to prepare yourself for it. And, you know, it's just it's important to receive the truth of God. I mean, I know you'd like to come to church every Sunday and it'd be like a foot massage. <laughs> but that's not why we come to church, is it? That's not why we come to church. It's not a spa. You know, we come to church because we want to know what God thinks. That's why we come. 1 Samuel 15, verse 1, it says, And Samuel said to Saul, Now, now what's going on here uh, is... King, king Saul, Saul has been made king. He's first king over the Israelites. And God is going to give him some very clear instructions of a command that he, wants him to, uh, that he wants him to carry out. It comes through the prophet Samuel. So Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Remember, these are not Samuel's words. These are the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek, did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man, woman, child, infant, ox, and sheep, camel, and donkey. This is a complete and total annihilation. It is an act of judgment on the people of Amalek by God. God is the only one in the entire universe that is authorized to issue such acts. But he's God. And if he says this is the proper judgment, then he's right. He's, he is the one that's issuing this decree. He says, this is what I want you to do. It's an act of judgment. You're not free to, you know, waver from it one little bit. You're not free to put your own opinion in it. You're not free to change it. This is my command that I'm telling you to carry out. I am Lord. You are servant. Go obey, right? This is the relationship that we're supposed to have with God. So he said, Go carry this out. The instruction is clear. It's not pleasant, but it is clear. And it is also wasteful, at least seemingly. When Saul heard this, he's like, wait a minute. First of all, this seems, in a lot of ways, this seems heartless. To go, you know, kill man, woman, child, ox, donkey. And then it seems wasteful because they would, normally when people would go to war, they would plunder, man. They would take... They would take animals, they would take jewelry, so they would take, you know, clothing and that sort of thing. He says, nope, not one thing, devote it all to destruction, I want it all destroyed. So in verse 7, it says, And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and devoted to, to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction, but they kept the best. So is this what the Lord told Saul to do? That is not the instruction that, that he gave him. So what happened here? There's a clear instruction from God. And then at some point, human reasoning begins to work its way in. Okay, God said, destroy completely. Don't keep an ox, a sheep, a goat, a donkey, a robe, a, you know, a bracelet, nothing. Destroy it all. But at some point, human reasoning comes in. This is how it always works with the commands of God. You will see this at work in our nation today. If you, if you just listen just a little bit, you will hear this. Well... What does the Word of God say about this issue? What does the Word of God... Well, it says this, but... Then comes in the human reasoning and the expl explanation and why this is okay and why it doesn't really quite mean that and the whole thing starts to be twisted. All the way back to the garden, we see this. 
Adam and Eve, God gives a plain, very simple command. Adam and Eve, what does Satan do? He comes in, he says, did God really say? And he begins to question what the, the clear command of God. God said, you can eat of all the trees in the garden, but of this one tree, do not eat. But Satan comes in, he begins, did God really say such and such? He begins to, 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 to twist it and, and question it. The same thing is at work today in all of our lives. Did God really say this? Did he really mean this? Is that really what the word of God means when it says this? Because that seems harsh. That seems outdated. That seems, you know, not to fit within our culture. That seems offensive. Are we really supposed to follow that? Well, I think that's asking the wrong question completely. I think that's asking the wrong question completely. The heart of a believer is not to constantly question the word of God and figure out ways to get around it or get out of it. The heart of a believer is supposed to be saying, man, that's what the Word of God says. How do I follow that in this culture? How do I follow that in the present time? How do we live by that faithfully without violating our conscience and without violating God as our Lord? That ought to be the better question. So the, the command is clear, but then human reasoning comes in. And I don't, you know, we don't know the exact conversation, but later on in the story... Saul tells Samuel, he says, well, I wanted to destroy those things, uh, but the people. And he keeps blaming the people. He said, but the people didn't want to do it. And the people wanted to keep the best of the, the sheep and the lambs. Because actually, it was for a good reason. Because they wanted to offer them to the Lord. They, as a burnt offering. They wanted to slaughter them and kill them as a burnt offering. Well, that's, that's great, but that's not what God said to do. That's not what God said to do. So, let me just tell you that life is filled with good excuses for not obeying God. You can come up with them on your own. You don't even need the help of the devil. You can come up on w with your own. Plenty easy, you can come up with excuses not to obey God. I promise you, your flesh, the part of you that is still being redeemed and sanctified, your flesh will come up with plenty of good reasons not to obey God. When it comes time to pay taxes. When it comes time to figure out what movie you're going to watch on a Friday night when it comes time to how you're going to spend your money, what you're going to do, whether you're going to go to church on a Sunday. You don't even, you know, the devil, he's probably kicking back in a lot of cases going, I don't even need to get involved in that situation. They're just self-destroying. Because we'll just sabotage our own selves with this. We just get in a habit of making excuses or reasons not to follow God. But uh, it's always better to follow God. It's always better to just follow His way and His word. That's where the blessing is. That's where the prosperity is. And look, if you're here this morning, likely, hopefully, the Holy Spirit is already talking to you about some areas in your life that you're not following God. That's not meant to uh, condemn you. That's not. You understand the reason God does that is out of love. God, God doesn't show us areas in our life that need to be changed because he wants to bring down the hammer. Believe me, if he wanted to bring down the hammer, he could do it. And he would have already done it. He doesn't want to bring down the hammer. No, what he wants to do is give us space and time to repent so that the enemy's work doesn't get accomplished in our lives. That we can return and repent and be faithful to God and that his plan be accomplished in our lives. So if you're here this morning and you're starting to think, man, I, I got some things I need to work on. Well, welcome to the club. That's every, that's every one of us. You know, we've been fasting for 21 days. And I was telling Jen this morning, I said, man, during this fast, I, I see some things that I need to work on, some things that I need to change. And it, I, didn't tell, I didn't tell her what they were, but if I had told her, she could have said, you didn't need the Holy Spirit to tell you that. I could have told you that. <laughs> but I didn't tell her what they were for that reason. That's between me and God. <laughs> I ain't getting you involved. I don't need a second Holy Ghost. But, so that's just part of it. You, you're going to, you know, you're going to think as the word of God's going forth, the Bible says it's like a mirror. When, when you look in the mirror, what happens? When you wake up first thing in the morning and you look in the mirror, you hopefully you see some things wrong. If you don't, you really are blind. You wake up first thing in the morning, no, you see some things wrong. You got crust here, you got hair sticking out here, you got problems, you know. Well, I don't know anybody that doesn't wake up like that. But that's, the Bible says the Word of God is a mirror. So when we hear the Word of God, we preach the Word of God, we read the Word of God, it's supposed to be a mirror that shows us areas in our life that's wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what it's supposed to do. 
So if you're, if you're feeling this morning, well, I got some things wrong now. I need to work on some things in my life that aren't right. Great. The Word of God's doing its job. That's perfect. Now, the important part, though, as the Bible says, is when you see yourself in that mirror is to not walk away without doing anything. The Bible says that in the book of James. It says a person who hears the word and doesn't do it is like one who gets up and looks in the mirror and they see their appearance, but they don't do anything about it and they walk away. The important part is when we see ourselves to repent. That's the, that's the goal of, of God bringing the word to us is to say, God, forgive me for this. I'm sorry for living this way, ignoring your word, and choosing to live my own way. I want to make things right and follow God. And I'll tell you something else. There are those of you in here right now that God is speaking to you about things that you need to do, and one of the things that you're thinking about is that that's too hard to do that. That's too difficult to do that. That's, that's too big of a change to, to change that. But I just want to tell you that's a lie from the enemy. When you have God on your side and God is for you and you start trying to go in the, in the path of God, listen, His favor and His grace is going to come on your life. And He's going to help you to do that. Yeah, it may be difficult to make some changes that need to be made, but it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. So... Saul allows the human reasoning to come in. He didn't kill King Agag as he was supposed to. He did not kill the animals as he was supposed to. He, he let them live. And then in verse 10, it says, The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Samuel was angry. And he cried to the Lord all night. Now notice Samuel's more upset than Saul is. Saul's not upset that he disobeyed God. Samuel's not even the one that disobeyed God, but he's staying up all night and praying about it. He's, angry, he, he's frustrated. He's crying out to the Lord on Saul's behalf. Saul ought to be the one crying out for his own sin. Samuel didn't even do anything wrong. He's crying out on behalf of Saul. Verse 13, Samuel came to Saul and said to him, and Saul said to Samuel, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So apparently Saul slept great that night. <laughs> Saul didn't miss a wink. He didn't stay up all night. No, he woke up fresh, perky, happy. He walked up to Samuel. Samuel, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed all the commandments of the Lord. There is that incredible deception. Once again, he hasn't done what the Lord asked him to do, but he's convinced himself that he and God are good. This is amazing to me. This is amazing to me. That, the night before, God spoke to Samuel and said, I regret that I've even made him king. But he wakes up feeling great about himself, and he thinks, me and God are good. Let me just tell you, people wake up all the time thinking, me and God are good. We're fine. Oh, everything's good. Me and my Jesus. Everything's good. Listen, that is, in many cases, that is a deception that is on your life. Now, please understand. Please understand. This, I, I, I hate preaching stuff like this because you got people that really are following God, and they have a tender conscience, and they hear stuff like this, and they go, well, maybe God's mad at me. I'm, if, if, you're, if you're living right, and you're following God, and you're doing your best to follow the Lord... There is tremendous grace. There is tremendous love. There is, there is tremendous grace and love for our mistakes, okay, when we sin and when we make mistakes. That is not what this is, though. Okay, this is not, oh, I made a mistake. This was a purposeful and willful act of disobedience against God. Let me tell you where you need to be concerned, okay? It, there's, there's all through Scripture, there's plenty of space for believers to make mistakes and to sin and to repent and to have problems. We all do that. You understand? But there needs to be a distinction between a person who loves God, wants to do His will, and occasionally sins versus someone who's living in a state of sin and will not change it. And they know that they're in a state of sin. They know that God's dealing with them about it, but they don't want to change it. And so they just continue down the same path. That is way different than people sinning occasionally as a believer. So I have to be so careful when I preach this because people that 
God doesn't want you living under condemnation. And see, the enemy, Satan will come and take the other side of this where people who are living right and they're in a good place with God, he'll come and try to make you feel condemned. Instead of understanding, wait, no, I'm, I'm the righteousness of Christ. I'm a child of God. I don't have to be condemned because of mistakes and those types of things. That's not what we're talking about this morning. Okay? What we're talking about is if you are living in a continued state of sin and you know it, and you're not doing anything about it. Okay, that is the issue here. So, so Saul wakes up. He says, blessed be the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. See, Saul thought that half-hearted obedience was the same thing as wholehearted obedience. But the blessing of the Lord is not in half-hearted obedience. In verse 14, Samuel said, if you've done the commandment of the Lord, then what is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Isn't this amazing? There's all the evidence to the contrary. We can literally hear it in the background. But you're convinced that you have done the will of God. Saul said, well, they have brought them from the Amalekite. He immediately turned towards the people. He's not taking responsibility for this. They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. And then Samuel said to Saul, Stop! I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. I love people like Samuel. He's got no tolerance for this kind of foolishness. He said, You may have convinced yourself. You may have convinced all these weak people that followed you. And all these weak people that were supposed to be your counselors and your advisors telling you the right way to go, you may have convinced all of them, you ain't convincing me. I know this wasn't right, and you know it wasn't right. I'm not putting up with this foolishness for one second. He said, stop. I'll tell you what the Lord said to me this very night. He said, speak. And Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? In other words, you don't, you're not seeing yourself in the position that you're supposed to be walking in. He said, you're the king. I don't care what the people wanted to do. You are the king. The buck stops with you. The responsibility is on you. Don't start blaming other people for this. He said, though you're little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? In other words, you're the one the Lord gave the command to. And you're the one who's going to answer to the Lord for that command. Don't start blaming other people. He said, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Isn't this incredible? Still convinced. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of, of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said this powerful phrase that we all need to mark down and remember for all of eternity. He looked at him and he said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. So what he was telling him is all the good stuff that you were planning on doing for God, because God, does, did, God is the one that instituted burnt offerings. Okay, make no mistake about it, God loved burnt offerings. This might be one thing that kind of throws you when you read the Old Testament. You know, like, what, why is God into animal sacrifices and the smell and the aroma of the burnt offerings coming up like he loves it and he takes pleasure in it? Well, it was an act of worship. I've preached a whole sermon on that before, that the reason that God loved the burnt offerings because the smell and the aroma of it, of the lambs and such being slaughtered, was actually pointing to Jesus. Anytime Jesus saw a burnt offering, anytime God saw a burnt offering or smelt the smell or saw the blood, he was looking forward to Jesus. It was reminding him of what was coming. That's why it was so powerful. But notice, 
Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings? In other words, in worship, okay? Burnt offerings were worship. They're acts of worship. So if we're to apply this to our context today, we're all in church. We're worshiping. We did our duty. We came to church. We worshiped God. We sang the songs. We lifted our hands. So he would say it this way to us. Has the Lord as great delight in church attendance and worship as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than religious duty. And to listen is better than going to church or worship or those things. That's what, essentially, that's what it would have meant in this context. Burnt offerings are good. Sacrifice is good. Worship is good. Church attendance is good. Reading your Bible is good. None of them are as important as obedience Obedience is actually a higher form of worship than singing. That's why in the book of Romans, Paul says, Let us be a living sacrifice. Let our lives be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. As you live a life of holiness, that's more powerful than any burnt offering or any song we can sing or any worship that we do in church. Living a life of holiness in adherence to the Word of God is the most powerful act of worship that any believer can have. So he said, has the Lord as great delight in these things as he does in obeying? No, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than worship. Praise God. So... Saul mistook half-hearted obedience for wholehearted obedience. What ended up happening? Well, he lost his whole kingdom. His, his whole life went downhill from there. Now, in, when you read the Old Testament, you've got to filter everything through the cross. You know, the Old Testament, things were a little more harsh. Things were intense. People dropped dead, <laughs> you know, on the spot for things. Uh, but in the New Testament... Thank God we've got the cross. Some of us, if we lived in the Old Testament, we'd already be dead. We wouldn't even be here this morning. But praise God, we don't live in the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament under the blood, under the cross. Amen. So there's a lot of mercy and a lot of grace that is, that is for us. But still, make no mistake about it, God's heart on the issue is the same. God never changes. He, he may not punish the same way. He may not issue judgment the same way, but make no mistake about it, he feels the same way about sin as he did in the Old Testament. He feels the same way. Not changed on that at all. It's just that in his mercy and because of the sacrifice of his son, that judgment is slower. And oftentimes consequences are slower. But God feels the same way. His heart for us is repentance. His heart for us is not judgment. That's why you see many people that just reject God, go away from God. Uh, many times it seems like there is no consequence or punishment in their life. That's God's mercy. That's God's mercy. Because He doesn't want judgment for them. He wants mercy for them. He wants restoration for them. But we did get that one instance in the book of Acts where Ananias and Sapphira tried to lie about their offering. You remember that? And I always kind of laugh when I think about that because... They bring their offering and they lie about it. See, everybody was selling their pieces of land and bringing the money as proceeds to the church. And they got the idea. They kind of liked what they saw. You know, I don't know how they did it. I don't know if they called them up to the front and said, Man, Brother Barnabas sold his piece of land and he's giving all the money to the church. Let's give him a big hand, you know, and everybody clapped. I don't know if it happened like that. Probably not. They didn't care about that, you know, as much maybe. But people knew about it and they heard about it. And so... Ananias and Sapphira got the idea. They said, man, we kind of like the prestige and the, uh, the praise of man that's coming along with this. Let's, well, we don't want to give the whole thing, so let's sell our land. Let's keep half of it, and then let's give the other half to the church, but we'll say it's the whole thing. And so now you realize they could have kept, the, kept half. That was their prerogative. The problem was that they lied about it. They didn't, they didn't have to give. They could have given 5% of it. They didn't have to give any. But the problem was they went to Peter and they said, this is the whole thing. We sold our land and here's the money. And Peter, by the Holy Spirit, knew immediately it was a lie. 
And he even gave him another chance. Uh, Sapphira, particularly, he gave her another chance. Is this the whole amount that the Lord that that you sold the land for? Oh yes, this is the whole amount. Boom, she dropped dead, right there. Both of them dropped dead in the church. I'm glad God doesn't do that today. We'd have to have a special team. Uh, you know, we got the ushers. Then we'd have to have the elite ushers <laughs> to get ready to carry out people that drop dead in the foyer. You know. But I, I laugh when I read that story because it's almost, you know, this is right after Jesus died. So I don't know if like a little bit of the Old Testament just kind of slipped over one more time. It just was, they were just the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, if they'd been born a few years later, grace would have fully kicked in. They probably would have been alive. They'd been okay. But like one little more just jolt right there from the Old Testament got them. You don't really see that anymore in the New Testament. But they made the same mistake, you know, of assuming that, half-hearted obedience is the same as full. I, I don't doubt the Lord was leading them to give the full amount. It's probably why the punishment was so severe. I don't doubt that the Lord was leading them to give the whole thing, but they decided, no, we're only going to half-heartedly obey, and it cost them. Let me read a couple more scriptures to you before we close this morning. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 25, 12. I'm just going to read these uh, two out of the book of Psalm. It says, Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear Him. He makes His covenant known to them. It's always better to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. This is a, these, these scriptures that I'm reading are what happens when a person wholeheartedly serves the Lord. This word fear doesn't mean to be afraid of. It's talking about the highest level of reverence and respect that a person can have. He says, who, who are those who fear the Lord, who, who have the utmost reverence and respect for His presence, for His Word? He said, there's a few things that will happen. Number one, He will instruct them in the way they should choose. Isn't that powerful? Boy, how many of you could use some instruction from the Lord about the way that you're supposed to go and the things you're supposed to do? It's a byproduct of serving the Lord faithfully. When you fear the Lord, and you say, he said he will instruct him in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity. God's not against prosperity. Matter of fact, it is a reward for serving the Lord faithfully. Their descendants will inherit the land. In other words, it's going to spread from you to your kids. It's going to be a generational thing. The Lord confides in those who fear him to make his covenant known to them. Man, he says this is talking about friendship with the Lord. He says there'll be a, just like Moses, God spoke to Moses face to face to his friend. The Lord confides in those who fear him. Amen. Psalm 128.1 says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed. It shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall be the man who fears the Lord. Praise God. So there are nothing but blessings that come from following the Lord and fearing the Lord. It doesn't mean you won't have trouble, difficulty, issues. It just means that when you do have them, that the Lord is with you to go through them. Help sort them out. His favor's on you. People that fear the Lord go through difficulty just like everybody else. But the difference is you have God with you to help you get through it, sort it out, get answers you need, have favor, have grace, doors open up for you. He gets you through the whole, through the whole thing. If there's The last thing I want to tell you this morning as we close, when we're reading about the blessing of the Lord, you get all these descriptors in Scripture. You get prosperity, you see the family, you know, your wife will be a fruitful vine, your kids will be olive shoots around. You get all these different things that are trying to describe what the blessing of the Lord is about. But if you've never lived under the blessing of the Lord, it's really hard for your mind to grasp exactly what it is and what it looks like. It's kind of like if you've never had Ben and Jerry's ice cream, you know. And I was trying to describe to you what it was like. I mean, I can go through the chocolatey flavors and the all. I can go through it. But if you've never had ice cream, it's like, man, I mean, I could tell he's really excited about it. But I've never had it. It's just hard to explain. The blessing of the Lord's kind of like that. I mean, it's better than Ben and Jerry. I'm not trying to say that, you know. Maybe that was a bad example. But I'm just saying 
the blessing of the Lord is hard to explain if you've never walked under it because it permeates literally every single area of your life. Yes, it's your wife and your kids and your prosperity and your bank account and those things. Yes, but it's so much more than that. It's, it's, it has a lot to do with just a general contentment that you live in, no matter what state your life is in. It has to do with supernatural peace and supernatural joy that can't be obtained any other way. It has to do with your fellowship with God and the relationship that you have with Him. And so... All I want you to understand this morning as, you, as we get ready to leave is you can walk out of this place the same way that you came in or you can make an adjustment this morning. You can repent of things that are in your life that need to change. It's not really a prayer that we're going to pray. I mean, we, we'll, we'll have a time of prayer at the end, but it's not about saying a prayer. It's about making an adjustment in your heart and in your mind saying, I'm living differently when I leave this place. I'm starting today. It's a decision that has to be made in your life. And I fully believe that God has already been speaking to many hearts about what those changes are. Some of you need a complete overhaul. But you don't have to change it all in one day. What is the Lord talking to you about? Say, you know, I just got too much. I just it's just too much that I've got to work on. But there's this one thing I know that God is really talking to me about that I need to make the adjustment on. And make that. Be faithful to do that. And as you do that, the blessing will come and he'll give you the grace and the power to follow through on all the rest. Amen. Let's stand up together. I want to pray for you as we leave this morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer together. Father, we come before you this morning by the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. What a privilege to be in your presence. What a privilege to be children of God. Father, right now, just as a church, we take a moment to repent if we have intentionally ignored your word, if we have deceived ourselves about an area of the Word of God. God, if we're living in ways that we know we shouldn't be, God, we just repent right now. We take a moment to ask you to forgive us, to make changes in those areas. God, I pray for every person whose heart this morning is filled with the desire to repent and change. I pray that they would not fight this fight on their own, but God, that you would empower them through your Word you would empower them through your Holy Spirit to make the changes that are necessary. And God, I pray that as people turn and they reach out to you, that they would find favor, they would find grace, they would find mercy, they would find strength to help them do the things that they need to do. God, I give you praise for that. We ask for your help and your assistance this morning in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and eye closed this morning, I want to give you an opportunity. If you're in this room today, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never committed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You can do that this morning. If you say, I want to make that commitment this morning, I want to be a new person. I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ for my salvation. I want to repent of my sin and turn to God. If that's you, you can do that this morning. Or if you've done it before, but you just you know you're away from God and you need to make things right this morning, I want to pray for you. God's going to hear your prayer. As I said, the prayer is not the end all, but it's a beginning of what God wants to do in your life. It begins with making that commitment to God. And so if that's you, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you, make you come down to the front, anything like that. I just want to pray for you right where you're at in your seat this morning. God's going to see you. God's going to hear your prayer. It's between you and God. If that's you this morning, I want to pray for you. Would you just lift your hand? Don't be ashamed. Just lift it up so I can see it. I want to pray for you this morning. Praise God. You can put your hands down. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for you. And then I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me that you're going to pray to God. Father, I pray for those that lifted their hand this morning. God, they're reaching out to you. They're making a commitment this morning saying, I want to live for you. 
I want things to be different in my life. I want to be a sold out follower of Jesus Christ wholeheartedly, completely. Father, I pray that you would honor their action and their decision of reaching out to you this morning and that you would pour your spirit out upon their lives. You would wash them clean this morning by your Holy Spirit. Let them walk out of here today free from guilt, free from the weight of sin, free from addiction. God, free from the power of sin. Just break that off of their life in Jesus' name this morning. Father, I pray that as we pray to you in just a moment, that, Father, you would respond to their prayer, that as we draw near to you, you would draw near to us, and that you would do the work that only you can do in their lives, that you would transform their heart, you would transform their inner man and and create a new creation on the inside of them, that old things would pass away and all things would become new as they reach out to you this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. Now, if you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer after me. You're not praying it to me. You're praying it to God. So I want you to focus on God. He's going to hear your prayer. Congregation, feel free to pray along with us. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I repent of my sin. I ask you to forgive me. Today, I want to be different. I want to be a child of God. I put my faith in Jesus Christ for my salvation in Jesus name Amen Praise God Let's give those a hand that lifted their hand this morning Now listen if you raised your hand this morning and you prayed that prayer God heard your prayer I want you to understand it's just a beginning it's not a a solve all you know issue but it, it, it's a beginning to say I want to live for God I'm making a choice to begin that journey today and God heard that prayer the best thing you can do to continue that decision is to continue coming to church to hear the word of God each week let your spirit grow get in the word of God if you have a Bible get in, get in the word of God each day find out what the word of God says begin reading the New Testament Let the Lord speak to you through the Word of God. If you don't have a Bible, we can get you one. You can speak to me. You can speak to our ushers, our our weekend experience team. You let somebody know, we can get you a Bible. Let me pray for you as we're dismissed this morning. Father, I thank you for the powerful work that you've done in our hearts and lives this morning. I pray as we leave today that your spirit and your presence would go with us, God, into the afternoon just as we bask in your presence. Lord, and rejoice in the joy and the peace that's in our heart. Thank you for every good thing that you've done in our life. Lord, we love you and bless you as we leave this place today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise God. You guys are dismissed. And they got the idea, they kind of liked what they saw. You know, I don't know how they did it. I don't know if they called them up to the front and said, Man, Brother Barnabas sold his piece of land and he's giving all the money to the church. Let's give him a big hand, you know, and everybody clapped. I don't know if it happened like that. Probably not. They didn't care about that, you know, as much maybe. But people knew about it and they heard about it. And so Ananias and Sapphira got the idea. They said, Man, we kind of like the prestige and the. Uh, the praise of man that's coming along with this. Let's, well, we don't want to give the whole thing, so let's sell our land, let's keep half of it, and then let's give the other half to the church, but we'll say it's the whole thing. And so, now you realize they could have kept, the, they could have kept half, that was their prerogative. The problem was that they lied about it. They didn't, they didn't have to give, they could have given 5% of it. They didn't have to give any. But the problem was they went to Peter and they said, this is the whole thing, we sold our land and here's the money. And Peter, by the Holy Spirit, knew immediately it was a lie. And he even gave him another chance. Uh, Sapphira, particularly, he gave her another chance. Is this the whole amount that the Lord, that, that you sold the land for? Oh, yes, this is the whole amount. Boom, she dropped dead right there. Both of them dropped dead in the church. I'm glad God doesn't do that today. We'd have to have a special team. Uh, you know, we got the ushers. Then we'd have to have the elite ushers <laughs> to get ready to carry out people that drop dead in the foyer you know but 
I, I laugh when I read that story because it's almost, you know, this is right after Jesus died. So I don't know if like a little bit of the Old Testament just kind of slipped over one more time. It just was, they were just the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, if they'd been born a few years later, grace would have fully kicked in. They probably would have been alive. They'd been okay. But like one little more just jolt right there from the Old Testament got them. You don't really see that anymore in the New Testament. But they made the same mistake, you know, of assuming that half-hearted obedience is the same as full. I, I don't doubt the Lord was leading them to give the full amount. It's probably why the punishment was so severe. I don't doubt that the Lord was leading them to give the whole thing. But they decided, no, we're only going to half-heartedly obey, and it costs them. Let me read a couple more scriptures to you before we close this morning. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 25, 12. I'm just going to read these uh, two out of the book of Psalm. It says, Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear Him. He makes His covenant known to them. It's always better to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. This is a, these, these scriptures that I'm reading are what happens when a person wholeheartedly serves the Lord. This word fear doesn't mean to be afraid of. It's talking about the highest level of reverence and respect that a person can have. He says, who, who are those who fear the Lord, who, who have the utmost reverence and respect for His presence, for His Word? He said, there's a few things that will happen. Number one, He will instruct them in the way they should choose. Isn't that powerful? Boy, how many of you could use some instruction from the Lord about the way that you're supposed to go and the things you're supposed to do? It's a byproduct of serving the Lord faithfully. When you fear the Lord, and you say, He said, He will instruct him in the ways... They should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity. God's not against prosperity. Matter of fact, it is a reward for serving the Lord faithfully. Their descendants will inherit the land. In other words, it's going to spread from you to your kids. It's going to be a generational thing. The Lord confides in those who fear Him to make His covenant known to them. Man, He says, this is talking about friendship with the Lord. He says there'll be a, just like Moses, God spoke to Moses face to face to his friend. The Lord confides in those who fear him. Amen. Psalm 128, 1 says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed. It shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall be the man who fears the Lord. Praise God. So there are nothing but blessings that come from following the Lord and fearing the Lord. It doesn't mean you won't have trouble, difficulty, issues. It just means that when you do have them, that the Lord is with you to go through them. He'll sort them out. His favor's on you. People that fear the Lord go through difficulty just like everybody else. But the difference is you have God with you to help you get through it, sort it out, get answers you need, have favor, have grace, doors open up for you. He gets you through the whole, through the whole thing. If there's, the last thing I want to tell you this morning as we close, when we're reading about the blessing of the Lord, you get all these descriptors in Scripture. You get prosperity, you see the family, you know, your wife will be a fruitful vine, your kids will be olive shoots around. You get all these different things that are trying to describe what the blessing of the Lord is about. But if you've never lived under the blessing of the Lord, it's really hard for your mind to grasp exactly what it is and what it looks like. It's kind of like if you've never had Ben and Jerry's ice cream, you know. And I was trying to describe to you what it was like. I mean, I can go through the chocolatey flavors and the all. I can go through it. But if you've never had ice cream, it's like, man, I mean, I could tell he's really excited about it. But I've never had it. It's just hard to explain. The blessing of the Lord's kind of like that. I mean, it's better than Ben and Jerry. I'm not trying to say that. You know, maybe that was a bad example. But I'm just saying the blessing of the Lord is hard to explain. If you've never walked under it, because it permeates literally every single area of your life. Yes, it's your wife and your kids and your prosperity and your bank account and those things. Yes, but it's so much more than that. It's, it's, it has a lot to do with just a general contentment that you live in, no matter what state your life is in. It has to do with supernatural peace and supernatural joy that can't be obtained any other way. It has to do with your fellowship with God. 
and the relationship that you have with him. And so, all I want you to understand this morning as, you, as we get ready to leave is you can walk out of this place the same way that you came in or you can make an adjustment this morning. You can repent of things that are in your life that need to change. It's not really a prayer that we're going to pray. I mean, we, we'll have a time of prayer at the end, but it's not about saying a prayer. It's about making an adjustment in your heart and in your mind saying, I'm living differently when I leave this place. I'm starting today. It's a decision that has to be made in your life. And I fully believe that God has already been speaking to many hearts about what those changes are. Some of you need a complete overhaul. But you don't have to change it all in one day. What is the Lord talking to you about? Say, you know, I just got too much. <laughs> I just, it's just too much that I've got to work on. But there's this one thing I know that God is really talking to me about that I need to make the adjustment on. And make that. Be faithful to do that. And as you do that, the blessing will come, and he'll give you the grace and the power to follow through on all the rest. Amen? Let's stand up together. I want to pray for you as we leave this morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer together.